Okay, everybody, last time we were talking about um, the generalate of Minister General Paolo, Paolo Pisati. If you remember the last class, we talked about the life of the early friars, them getting started, and uh, uh, Il Giorgio joining the friars, and then we talked about the Minister General, the observance by the name of Paolo Pisati, who uh, history has recorded his ministry as Minister General as disastrous. And there is nothing good that anybody has to say about Pisotti. Now, let's talk a little bit about Pisotti and uh, the Capuchins. Um, so his general, it was such a disaster that he, as I mentioned in the last class, that he made the Capuchins look like the saviors of the church, right? Because it was such a mess, everything he was doing, that uh, the Capuchins were considered to be people who were uh, friars who were out there saving the order from the disastrous hands of Pisotti. Um and Pesodi had a great hatred for the Capuchins, a great hatred for them. He had no use for reforms, no use for reformers, and uh, he could care less about these friars who are out and about trying to live the rule as radically as the Capuchins were trying to live it. So he was a great persecutor of the reform. There have been many persecutors of reform movements, but certainly Pesodi ranks at the top of them in many ways. Okay? So... Several times he personally, personally petitioned the Pope for their suppression. He called them restless vagabonds. And these restless vagabonds needed to be crushed. So several times he was pushing the Pope to suppress them. Uh, Pesotti so defamed them that many people began to wonder if the Pope had not been duped by the Capuchins. So people looking around going, you know, if Pesotti is saying is true and the Pope is protecting them, then perhaps... Uh, these Capuchins have duped the Pope himself into thinking that somehow they're actually uh, got a legitimate cause here. Now, Pesotti obtained a papal brief uh, against the Capuchins. However, the brief never mentioned the Capuchins. Uh, so the papal brief denounced those observants who procured exemptions from obedience in order to live free of correction, placed themselves under the diocesan bishop, place themselves under obedience to the conventional general, go around without companions visiting inns. The brief annulled all and every apostolic rescript, even papal rescript, which exempted from ordinary jurisdiction of superiors and gave permission to found new sects or manner of life or erect houses of congregations against the will of the minister general and it forbid the introduction of new sects, new groups within the order. Um, and the use of the, a name not used by St. Francis himself. So this brief might be applied to the Reformati, the Discalci, to other groups of reformers, and it may have been applied to the Capuchins as well. However, uh, Ludovico Fossombroni was very clever when it came to canon law, and he said since this brief did not mention them by name, they considered themselves uh, exempt. Although Pesodi said, well, this is meant for everybody. But the Capuchin said, well, you don't really mention us by name, so it doesn't really apply to us. <laughs> and so that's how they were able to sneak around um, getting this uh, brief used against them. Uh, he expressly stated that all reforms, this is Pesotti, reforms were not, were, were, um, that were not suppressed were to return to their provinces immediately. So he wanted all the groups to return to their prom provinces immediately. Uh, but again, like I said, the Capuchins just ignored it because it said it doesn't mention us by name. So on May 15, 1530, Pisotti obtained another brief aimed at Ludovico and Il Giorgio. Uh, all apostolic concessions were annulled. Pisotti had the authority to recall them to their provinces, that they must live under the superiors of their original communities. Now, Ludovico being strong, held his ground, claiming that religione zealous was not mentioned by the new brief, so he ignored it, right? So Pisoni writes, gets this brief condemning the reform aimed at Ludovico and Il Giorgio and has all these demands and so forth, but it doesn't address the Capuchin's document, religione zealous. It doesn't suppress that. It doesn't denounce it or take it away by any shape or form. So Ludovico says, doesn't apply to us. Sorry, you must bet some other Ludovico or some other Il Giorgio because you didn't mention the brief Religione Zealous 
right? So, uh, uh, so Ludovico had friends in Rome who were working with him. So as Pisotti was doing his little end around uh, to try to suppress the Capish, Ludovico was there with some friends in Rome who were helping him get that uh, freedom necessary. So even the observant ministers ignored the brief. Pisodi was so disliked that even the provincials and the, and the guardians of the houses of the observants were just ignoring it as well. So there was another brief on May 27th, which was of the same caliber. So the briefs were so ignored that the Cardinal Protector allowed the Capuchins to found their second house in Rome, San Eufemia. The Cardinal of Naples gave them a residence. Uh, and the papal bull noted that those who, for a time, the Capuchins were officially established, the associated with the conventuals, so they considered the brief not meant for them. So this third brief does it says those who, who were a time living this way, Capuchins is like, well, that doesn't apply to us. So, so again, 15 months later, they reissued the bull again. But all of Pisodia's great efforts to crush the Capuchins were falling on deaf ears. Um, no one. Cardinals, provincials, no one was paying attention to them. Now remember, papal briefs uh, could be bought and sold. This papal brief doesn't mean the Pope signed it. It just means that a one of the papal offices did. So people ignored them a lot of times because they were bought and sold, uh, these papal briefs. Okay. Now, Cardinal Quinones, the former Minister General of the Observance, took interest in favor of the reform. So he himself was the member of a Spanish reform movement. So he opposed the caps for transferring to the cap, to the conventional jurisdiction, but he liked the fact of what they were doing. They were returning to the original Franciscan ideal and living the rule and the testament of St. Francis with, with fortitude, with fidelity, with a certain firmness of life. So he appreciated that. And so um, he wasn't happy with the fact they slipped underneath the conventuals because he himself was an observant but he was happy with them. So he proposed what he called seven chapters to bring peace. Uh, this document doesn't exist any longer. We don't have the document, but we know that he wrote up this document called the seven chapters. It meant to establish houses of recollection in order to observe the rules. So it was a way to reform the observance from within. And that these houses of recollection uh, would be granted legal protection and the caps were to be brought back into the observance, allowed to live in these houses of recollection where they can live the rule radically and faithfully without money, uh, without, um, you know, in begging and so forth with their uh, strong um, uh, poverty, their strong austerity, their strong life of prayer. So Pesodi, though, um, made it impossible for anyone to accept the, uh, the, the agreement. So Quinones, the former minister general, is having to deal with the new minister general, who is a pain in the, uh, you know what, to everyone, including Cardinal Quinones, making it impossible for Cardinal Quinones' plan to come together. So let's talk now about the Calabrian revolt. We talked about Illa Giorgio, who tried to start a reform in the Calabrian province, and fell apart, and then he sought out Ludovico, and he formed a union with the Capuchins, that these group of reformers from Calabria would join the Capuchins and be Capuchins. So when Il Giorgio left Rome, on his return to Calabria, when he had that permission to unite with the uh, uh, Capuchins, he stopped in to see the Viceroy regarding the transfer. transfer. The tra uh, and the Viceroy of Naples was Maria Lorenzo Longa. Maria Lorenzo Longa was a married woman. She uh, was miraculously healed at Lourdes. Her husband had been the Viceroy of Naples. Uh, then when he died, she became the Viceroy of Naples. Eventually, she built a beautiful hospital to the sick. And then she and companions, who were third order members, after meeting the Capuchins, assumed the Capuchin rule of life and entered a cloistered monastery. And she is the foundress of the poor Clares, the Capuchin poor Clares, are known as the Capuchinesses. But at this point, she's just viceroy. She's been healed. She's viceroy. She's founding her hospital in Naples. And uh, she grants, she's the one who got the friars the house in Naples. So the general Pesotti obtained a decree of excommunication towards the recollects from Calabria on the condition that they return to their province. So if they return home to their province, go back to their provincials, they won't be excommunicated. So they're being treated as traitors. 
In the summer of 1532, there was a general chapter in Messina presided over by Pesotti. The provincial chapter in Calabria happened later on Pentecost. So before the chapter of Messina, Bernardino of Reggio and Ludovico of Reggio, different than Ludovico Fosombrone, Ludovico Reggio, on behalf of the Recollects, petitioned the chapter to transfer to the Capuchins. This is Il Giorgio, right? And Ludovico of um, Reggio. They did not expect a yes, only in appliance to the law. Basotti listened to their request and told them to wait for the, cha the general chapter. He tried to persuade them by promising to make them guardians and superiors and promising all kinds of things. The Recollects representatives presented their case to the chapter. They were so violently upbraided that they fled. So they waited until the general chapter, went to the general chapter, and then were treated like dirt, and so they just fled. So Ludovico de Reggio took his petition to the Duke of Norcia. The Duke took him, them under his protection and promised to go to the courts of Rome for them. Now at this point, those recollects from Calabria, who were working in conjunction with Ludovico Fossombrone, 30 numbered, gathered in the Duke's home. So Tuesday after Trinity Sunday, uh, they held a chapter of their own, supposedly they had Pesotti's permission, and Ludovico de Reggio was elected the provincial. At the chapter, they wore the pointed hood, sewn to their ha own habit, but yet they could not obtain the coarse wool, so they just had used what they had. So they basically became Capuchin at that moment. So on July 3rd, Pesotti obtained another letter of excommunication. Bishops were commanded under pain of suppression to enforce the brief and hand over the recollects to secular arms. The Viceroy of Naples and the Duke of Norcia were supposed to assist. Now, a group of observants went to the Duke and demanded that the friars be handed over. The Duke brought the two groups to a meeting. The recollects defended themselves and leveled their accusations against the observants. The observants could not argue their points and they did not enforce the excommunication. Some recollects fearing excommunication did return to the observants. So we have the situation where we have these recollects from Calabria who are trying to join the Capuchins, there's 30 of them. They have their own little chapter. They, they elect Ludovico of Reggio as their superior. They have the wearing the long pointed hood. The Duke of Norcia, the Viceroy of Naples, bring them all together and the observants put up this great argument of how it's possible to live the rule of life as an observance, but Ludovico de Reggio and Giorgio all pointed out the fact that it was impossible for them to be able to truly observe the original life within the Capuchins, oh, I'm sorry, within the observance. And they left and wanted to join the Capuchins because they wanted the freedom to live the rule as Francis had given it to them. They were fighting for poverty, they were fighting for penance, they were fighting for the contemplative part of the life. They were fighting for the true and real Franciscan ideal to be lived uh, together in community with, in freedom from any kind of, of legislation or any kind of superior that would in any way try to mitigate the life. So, Padre Honorio de Cajano, the observance protector, presented a petition to the Pope for the suppression of the Calabrian Capuchins, these Calabrian recollects. He only knew of them from hearsay. He didn't know them for anything about them. The Duke of Norcia, however, sent an envoy to Rome to plead for the friars before the Pope. And so Pope, the Pope commissioned two cardinals to investigate the case. On August 14th, the Pope made his final decision. So these were the decisions of the Pope. The Capuchins were forbidden to receive any more observance. The minister general was to cease his persecution and leave the congregation in peace. Now, many observants wanted to transfer, so it did not settle any, anything for them. However, uh, at this point, it created a little bit of peace. But meanwhile, many Reformed conventuals were now joining the Capuchins. So not only do we have you know, all these uh, observant friars would join the Capuchins. And so then the Pope says, okay, no more, no more observants can join. And in the meantime, you have this influx of conventuals joining the Capuchins, swelling the ranks. You know, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, we, we blocked up one hole, but then there's all these uh, uh, friars pouring in from the conventual side. But it also didn't plug up the hole of the observants long enough because many observants wanted to join the Capuchin reform. So 
Now the Venetian province of observance, so the province from Venice. The province was in incredible trouble over elections. Pisodi, in order to maintain himself, removed certain friars' right to vote so his favorites would be elected. So you see a little maneuvering going on here by Pisodi to maintain power up in Venice. Now, there was one particular friar who was working for Pisotti and being sent by him to take care of these shaky elections. His name will live in infamy among the Capuchins. His name is Bernardino Aquino. Bernardino of Aquino. We tend to refer to him as Aquino, even though it's where he's from, not his name, in order to distinguish him from other Bernardinos. But Bernardino of Aquino. So we'll call him Aquino, so just so you know. So this friar in Venice sent by Pisotti to go there to kind of deal these shaky deals for him is a man by the name of Bernardino of Aquino. Now, the chapter at Messina, going back down to Sicily, approved of Pisotti's actions, even though the recollects had protested the abuse. Rome began an investigation of Pisotti, and they forced him to resign that July. Fra Cofara was working for unity from within the order. Now, Bonaventure, an observant, received a letter from Cofara. He asked to petition the Pope for the privilege of being able to live the reform from within. Bonaventure met Francesco da Gesi. Francesco da Gesi was, was there on the behalf of the observant reformers of the marches. He was accompanied by another great and incredible true spiritual father who will become the true spiritual father of the Capuchins, Bernardino of Asti. We refer to him many times as Asti, the place that he's from, um, because there's so many Bernardinos. But we have, so, um, we have Francesco the Jay-Z, a reformer from the marches, accompanied by Bernardino Vasti, along with Stefano de Molina. Okay, these three guys, along with Bonaventure, began to talk about reform from within. Bernardino Vasti and Stefano were also known for their connection with the Spanish houses of recollection. And Bernardino de Asti was more than once the provincial in Rome, so he had a bit of, a, of, of clout, having been once the provincial of Rome. So in 1532, the reform leaders of these different groups all met in Rome. And after meeting Bonaventure, uh, they asked the provincials that houses of recollection be established. And um, the response to Bonaventure was, uh, the observance wishing to live the rule will not be prevented. Four to five friaries near each other will be set up in each province. The general minister or provincial minister shall not put up obstacles to these houses. Houses will be governed by friars chosen from among themselves and approved by the minister general or their provincial minister. And this gave the observance room for reform. So these guys, Stephen of Molino, Bernardino of Asti, uh, Jerome of Ascoli, and Bonaventure, they were trying to create a way to truly live the reform within the observance. Houses near each other, governed by men of their own houses, so it wouldn't be interrupted, basically, was the deal. So Bonaventure was content until he heard that Francesco de Gesi and companions were thrown into prison upon the return to their provinces. So he makes this deal with them, right, that they can do this within the order, they get back to their provinces, and they're imprisoned. Now, the papal bull was not going to be sent to Venice because of the opposition of the superiors. The Pope suspended the bull until the 1535 general chapter. So Bonaventure retired with some brothers to a hermitage friary. He had basically had, had it. Stefano returned to Fonte Colombo, which is an ancient friary with fans throughout the rule. All hope for reform among the observants was lost as a result of all of this. So in 1534, a number of the most active members of the reform joined the Capuchins. So the observant friars begin to migrate to the Capuchins because they are not doing the reform from within. And here are three names that were incredibly, incredibly important to the reform of the Capuchins. We could say that they really became the backbone of the Capuchin observance. Ludovico Fossombroni did a great job blazing the trail. Uh, Matteo de Bascio did a great job opening the door. But these men become the true foundation stones of the reform. Bernardino da Asti, Francesco de Gesi, and 
You ready? Giovanni Di Fano, John Di Fano, the provincial who persecuted both uh, Ludovico Fosabrone, his brother, Amadeo de Baccio. Even he gave up. You know, the one who tried to, who imprisoned, you know, uh, Ludovico and Matteo, you know, uh, he himself joined. And what he did was, in tears of repentance, he presented himself to Ludovico Fosombrone. And like another Saul, the Capuchins, and he laughed about the persecution days. You know, so you see a very humble man in John Fano, Giovanni Di Fano, a very humble man who went and recognized what the Capuchins were doing was correct. So these three men were momentous in consequence. Momentous. All were of tried character, of outstanding abilities, reputed among all the observants as incredible, good, devout men. And they were also noble preachers. So they got the best of the best from the observant reform joining the Capish reform. Now, Bernardino de Aquino, who we mentioned up there in, in Venice, also joins at the same time. And he played a sinister part in that Venice chapter, as you mentioned. So some say he became a Capuchin because Pisodi's downfall. And so Aquino was unwelcomed in the observance, and that's really why he joined. Others will say it was because of a real conversion. And he was one of the most notable preachers in Italy. So for the Capuchin, it was like, Aquino, the notable preacher, he wants to join? <gasps> wow! Did anybody really know about his little wheelings and dealings under Pisodi? Maybe not. Maybe so. In any event, uh, it was either forgiveness on the part of the Capuchins or um, perhaps a presumption that he was truly a good man who meant good things and now was going to really give himself to the life 100%. So the observance was shocked over the desertion and took action. They did not like the fact that these men of such high quality, particularly Francesco de Gesi, uh, uh, John Afano, and Bernardino Vasti, uh, they were really upset that they joined. So the vicar general at the time, Leonardo Pubiccio and Cardinal Quignone, sought actually to suppress the Capuchins. Quignones turned on them when he saw these men of such great quality joining the Capuchins. And they allied with the procurator Honorio, now the confessor to the Pope. So now they have the Pope's confessor on the side against the Capuchins. So on April 15, 1534, a rescript to Cardinal Della Valle, ordering all observants who passed over to the Capuchins to return under pain of excommunication. It was directed in order to suppress the Capuchins. They were given 15 days to return. Ten days later, on the Feast of St. Mark, a brief was read to the San Euphemio Friary in Rome, ordering them to abandon it without delay. The cardinal protector lit a lamp and told them to leave by candlelight. They were sitting at supper at the time. What did the friars do? Did they protest? Did they get angry and so forth? No. Following their constitutions, that they were pilgrims and strangers, they obediently picked up their breviaries, and processed out to the hospital of San Lorenzo, who took them in for a place to stay. They just left in peace. Just as the Capuchins' constitutions from Albacina said, that when they're, you know, they're thrown out, they go. It wasn't theirs. Now, Ludovico Fosombroni retaliated. He called upon the help of Catherine of Chibo and Victoria Colonna, and Camillo Orsini, as well as others. The people of Rome were very unhappy with their departure. They were not happy that the Capuchins, who had been serving the plague victims at the hospital, were now thrown out of their friaries. So they had the people on their side as well. So a few days later, there was another brief uh, from the Pope. So it said that the Capuchins may not receive any more observance and said nothing about them having to return to their friaries. So they didn't. Back to the observant friaries. So they didn't. Okay. So um, let's just finish this section here. So September and the following events. So the Pope Clement dies, and then Pope Paul III is elected, and there's an observant general chapter. Uh, it commissioned every province to have a house of recollection. There followed a brief forbidding any Capuchins to receive observant friars. The brief had one modification, and this was incredibly important. So there was this brief that no observants were allowed to join 
the Capuchins, but there was a little loophole. This is the loophole. Unless houses of recollection were established within two months, observant friars desirous of reform might pass over to the Capuchins. And what happened? They didn't establish those houses of recollection, and so observant friars left and joined the Capuchins, once again swelling the ranks. And on a final note here, on November 7th, the Minister General Paolo Pesotti died in Parma. So uh, <laughs> Pesotti passes away into uh, a very negative history, right? His, um, it was, didn't go well for him. So in our next class, we're going to look at the internal reorganization and crisis. So we look at the years 1534 to 1538. If you thought the battle of the Capuchins to exist was over, far from it. They have another, oh, let's say uh, 40 years to go <laughs> before they're, uh, but maybe less than that, maybe 20 years before they're finally out of the woods. Um, you know, they went through round, This I think this is round two now. Uh, there's another round coming up where they're going to have to fight for their existence. And soon after that, we're going to see how they uh, really will have to struggle and plead for their existence. Um, it's truly a miracle that the Capuchin reform actually got off the ground. When you see that everything that was against them, when you see how many people were fighting against them from, uh, from cardinals and bishops, it, it's just amazing. And they'll go through their own internal crisis. Um, so, you know, Franciscan reform movements are very, very, very delicate, very delicate. Um, and, uh, nothing is guaranteed with reform movements. There's always a persecution and, uh, there's always going to be its struggles and difficulties. And, um, and so I guess gold is tested in fire, right? But, uh, you see with the Capuchins, they never stop persevering, pushing forward, uh, to live that life that God had granted to them. Nothing was going to stop them. Say what you want about Ludovico Fossombroni, and we'll see some stuff about him later. The man had perseverance. Um, same with the men I mentioned, the Bernardino of Asti and uh, Jerome Vascoli and so forth and others. Okay. All right. We're going to pick up uh, tomorrow. So um, thank you all. We'll see you soon. All right. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.